Doctors of Reddit, what was the worst thing you've seen for a patient that another doctor overlooked? During my residency, we had this lady in her 60s who was getting progressively more forgetful, just overall declining, and getting less and less able to take care of herself. She had been seeing her PCP who diagnosed her with dementia. And she saw a neurologist who agreed. She was not really able to provide an accurate history. After talking to her family and friends, it became apparent that her symptoms were progressing unusually quickly. I remember seeing the point where her new hair growth met her bright red dye and also her grown out nails with hot pink polish thinking, wow, it really wasn't too long ago that she was not only taking care of herself but also like, going to get her hair and nails done. The lady in front of me was so far from that. The neurologist I was training with recognized this, had her admitted and did every test including lumbar puncture. Workup eventually showed Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, mad cow, which there is unfortunately no treatment for. She died a few months later but at least we were able to prepare her family that she would only continue to decline so they could make arrangements. Really sad situation. Rattlesnake bite. On a two-year-old. Patient and dad out in the fields near a small town that is several hours away from the nearest big city, where I work. Dad takes the child to the ER in the small town with an obvious snake bite, doctor there says, A it's okay she probably didn't get envenomated. Doesn't give the patient anti-venom, which they had at that hospital, and instead of electing to send the child to us by helicopter, he sent her by ambulance. Several hours later patient shows up to our hospital coding, and ended up dying. Probably didn't get envenomated? What the f kind of stupid ass idea is that? If a tiny child gets bitten by a rattlesnake, you assume they've been envenomated and you treat them as though that had been. That means anti-venom, physiological support, etc. completely absurd. Please tell me they sued. He put the pacemaker lead in the subclavian artery, and across the aortic valve into the left ventricle. The proper approach is subclavian vein to right ventricle. And then he didn't notice it for over a year. I saw the patient, a 25-year-old woman who didn't need the pacemaker in the first place, when she was in congestive heart failure because the pacemaker lead had destroyed the valve. A surgeon and I had to do surgery to remove the pacemaker and lead. Then replace the aortic valve. Totally inexcusable. Well, 50% of doctors are below average, but everybody thinks theirs is in the top 10%. Neurologist sent patient to our ed without informing her that imaging showed a glioblastoma assuring her impending death. He didn't overlook the disease, he overlooked the communication. He just sent her over for you to do the dirty work of telling her she was dying. Geesh. That is the crappiest thing one doctor can do to the next. Now imagine you're a nurse, that just read the diagnosis in the chart and as you go to educate the patient on management or meds, the patient says, I have what? Uh, let me call the doctor. Giving a diagnosis is way above my pay grade. This is so common. I used to work in maternal fetal medicine, and every single week, we would have women referred to us because the doctor couldn't see something clearly with the baby and wanted to double check. Nope, they just didn't want to have to be the ones to tell you that your baby had a complex cardiac defect or multiple anomalies indicative of a genetic syndrome or any other of a large number of horrible things that can happen during fetal development. Still pisses me off when I think about how many women waited weeks for more information because their doctors were cowards who couldn't tell them, there's something seriously wrong here. I can't see it quite clearly, didn't sound serious, so the appointment wasn't made with any urgency, and now you're 24 weeks pregnant with a fetus that will not survive infancy, and have no options but to carry to term and hope for a quick and painless death shortly after birth. MD here. Recently was called over by a nurse who told me a patient's bandages were wet as they were bleeding a little. Patient had recently had his leg amputated. We pulled his bandages off and found a spurting femoral artery, at this point the patient passed out. Patient was sent to theaters for an emergency operation. Close call for sure. Bleeding a little. Tis but a scratch. Your whole leg's gone. No it's not, it's right over there. This happened to my stepfather. He was two weeks post-op from a frozen elephant trunk aortic dissection repair and his bandages were sticky on his leg, he texted some pics to the doctor and he was told to come into the office the next day. 
nurse lifts the bandage and bam, spurting femoral. The problem was that he was in the doctor's office in the tower of the hospital. Surgeon had to get on the phone with risk management and raise hell to let him woo my stepdad through the lobby, past the Starbucks, because it was the quickest way to the ore, they wanted to put him in an ambulance to drive one block over. Blood everywhere, security and cleaning team followed behind and or team surrounded the bed, gurney? And a nurse was literally sitting on top of him to apply pressure as we walked past everyone and their mother. Super scary. He's fine now though. Crazy thing is that I wasn't supposed to be there that day. I live an hour away but when my mom told me about the appointment, I had a really bad feeling in my stomach and left work early to be with them. I'm super grateful for that foresight because otherwise my mom would have been alone the whole time. I found an obvious huge rectal cancer on a patient who was previously told over and over again that she had hemorrhoids. My sister-in-law was fobbed off with the exact same thing. Young female sever chronic abdominal pain. Finally referred for a scan which was cancelled because she was low risk. She was again in a lot of pain so my brother insisted she be checked again this time by a new physician who decided to do a rectal check. Diagnosed with colon cancer there and the and immediately referred for a scan then to the best specialist in the area. Chemo, removal of most her bowels narrowly avoided a bag and a lifetime of adjustments but thankfully in remission now. Two years of being diagnosed with piles instead. I run into this a lot as a surgeon. Very few primary care providers will do a rectal exam. Just tell the patient that rectal bleeding probably hemorrhoids and give them ointment. If it doesn't resolve within a few months, I get the referral for hemorrhoid surgery and find the rectal mass. Either that, or find a colon cancer on the colonoscopy that they should have ordered months ago. Yes. Exactly. Also, a surgeon who has seen far too many fungating distal rectal cancers in patients diagnosed with hemorrhoids for ages. Any clues as to how a patient would know the difference? I always worry about prostate slash colon cancer etc but was under the impression that if it's frank blood it's hemorrhoids. In residency, I saw a cardiologist miss a steamy, heart attack. By the time the patient came to us, some of the muscles supporting one of his heart valves had completely died and he was in cardiogenic shock, basically his heart function was so bad that it wasn't circulating the blood in his body enough to support life. It was awful. Happily, he made it through though. It was obvious on ECG. It was like textbook tombstones on the ECG, no idea how it was missed. Once when I was a medical student on surgery rotation, in trauma, we had a patient come in after he fell on the street and bonked his head. Well apparently, he had fallen once earlier that day and was discharged when the trauma workup at the other hospital was negative for injuries. We examined him and noticed his eyes were kind of, yellow. So as part of our trauma workup, given that he couldn't give a great story and we couldn't be sure what happened, we CT scanned his abdomen, and saw his common bile duct was like three times normal size, could drive a truck through it. About that time, next set of vitals his temp was 103 F. Guy was floridly septic from ascending cholangitis which is why he was falling down. Big miss and that is an emergency. I like how you use the word bonked. I hope it was the same language in his medical record. Young student from, I think, Pakistan. He was complaining about his neck feeling stiff, he went to a doctor some days before and he was told he was having joint pains that would pass with some common anti-inflammatory drugs. When I visited him I saw many of the lymph nodes in his neck were swollen, which probably caused the stiffness, and not painful, not a good sign. Sent him right away to have a chest x-ray that showed a huge mediastinical mass, suggestive of lymphoma. Sadly, I don't know what happened to him. Not as bad as that, but I had neck and shoulder pain and stiffness for about 5 years with docs telling me it was just soreness, text neck, etc. and prescribing NSAIDs and muscle relaxers. Finally a new doc said to see a rheumatologist. Diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis. Doc said it is often misdiagnosed or left undiagnosed. Frustrated me for so long because I knew something was not right. Edit, for those who aren't familiar, about living with AS if this post encourages someone to get a referral and helps to catch something earlier on, I will be super happy. AS may not have a cure, but it can be managed to some degree. Edit 2, holy hell. Thank you all for the support and for sharing your experiences. I'm going to try and respond to everyone. 
I'll be very clear that I am not in any way shape or form a medical professional so I can only share my personal experience. But, just knowing that some of you are going to look into your own symptoms with your doc is freaking awesome. And as others have noted, you can join the party on slash r slash ankylosing spondylitis. Yes. Web link. Reddit link. I work in a EMS. We got a call for a female with leg pain. When we arrive on scene, this woman's leg is three times the size of her other one, blue and purple, and she has no pulse in her foot. She fell on ice a few days prior and the urgent care didn't do any x-rays, told her she had a sprain, and gave her a walking boot. In reality, her tibia and fibula were both so badly fractured they were cutting the blood vessels and muscle tissue. She lost her foot. One that comes to mind is when I was a resident, the ED doctor wanted to admit a mild septic patient with a UTI. I review her labs, and knowing that she is a diabetic, it was obvious florid DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. That kind of admission typically goes straight to the ICU to get insulin via a drip and aggressive four fluid rehydration. She was just in the ED hallway with no medications at all looking like crap. One of my proudest moments here, I work in a nursing home and had been there for about four months at the time, no prior healthcare experience went into a resident's room, she was diabetic but I didn't know this at the time, and as I leaned in to speak to her, I smelled ketones on her breath. She was also pretty lethargic and her lethargy had been noted by staff on an earlier shift. I was immediately worried. I called the nurse on duty to her room, who said, ah she's just having a sleepy day. I explained I could smell ketones and she laughed and said I didn't know what I was talking about, and headed back downstairs. I called an ambulance for that woman myself and she was taken to A&E and diagnosed with diabetic ketoacidosis. Poor woman was a few hours from death. They told him go home it's nothing to you when he came to me, we barely saved him he had a ruptured appendix. This happened to my brother, except it was go home, you just want a fentanyl fix. He was in the hospital for almost two weeks over a ruptured appendix. A few years ago, my wife blew her back out, big time. Fully ruptured discs in L4 L5 S1. Get her to the ER where she is absolutely screeching in pain. Junkie looking for a fix was their first go-to. Jesus, I've never even done worse than tweak my back slightly from a bad lift, I can't imagine the pain of three discs rupturing like that. Why is Junkie looking for a fix such a common sentiment? At least do some x-rays in the interest of caution, Jesus. Edit, laughing out loud just realized Jesus was the first and last word in my comment. My sister-in-law went to the hospital claiming a pain in her side the doctor, who didn't even lay hands on her, told her it's just her ovaries popping and to take some ibuprofen. My sister-in-law being the trauma nurse she is and knowing something was most definitely wrong went to another hospital where the doctor did lay hands on her then sent her immediately to the OR for an emergency appendectomy. I do believe she sent her records to the first hospital with a strongly worded letter. There was a story pretty recently in the hospital I work for, where a cardiologist in the ER was doing a rather difficult night shift, started feeling lightheaded, dizzy, and fatigued. Given how intense those shifts are, 26 plus plus, hours, sometimes multiple times a week, nobody thought much of it, and the doctor in question went to catch a quick nap in the staff room. People just pass by him in the staff room every once in a while, but they just assumed the poor guy was exhausted and let him rest. He was dead for several hours by the time someone realized something wasn't right. Not a doctor. We had someone at work die at her desk and it took almost 12 hours for someone to realize it. They thought she was sleeping and only realized something was wrong when they tried to wake her up at shift change. Anytime I see someone sleeping in a strange area in public I immediately wonder if they're dead. Walked by a guy laying down on the lawn of City Hall in the city I used to live in. I was registering my dog license. Didn't think much of it. Turns out, he was dead from a heroin odd. His baseball hat was over his face as if you put it if you were trying to block out the sun and rest. As sunset approached, someone noticed he had been there all day, and called 911. He was dead for several hours. When I lived in Portland, I often found myself checking on people a lot just to be sure. Never bothered anyone or got in their space if they looked like they were asleep, but I can't recall the number of times I made another trip around the block, 
or watched someone from my window until I was certain they were just deeply asleep. I called for welfare checks or an ambulance more than a few times as well. Before the assaults and muggings were happening in broad daylight, I'd even go check on people myself. I'm really paranoid about the fact that some medical emergencies present similarly to extreme drunkenness, or like someone is on drugs, i.e. slurring speech and stumbling, vomiting, passing out, saying or doing weird things. At least one of the drunks I called an ambulance on was actually having something much more severe happening to him EMTs couldn't raise him to full consciousness and his blood oxygen levels must have been low because they put a mask on him immediately. Either alcohol poisoning or something else, but alcohol poisoning kills people too. That's horrible. Were there other people with her the entire time? Yep. She was in a building full of people, in her office. They thought she was sleeping. Those shifts are absolute bullcrap. Poor guy indeed. Did he tell anyone he was feeling off before he went to lie down? I imagine he did, since they were able to tell what went down that night. But no clue otherwise. Absolutely ridiculous how long some hospital shifts are. They aren't healthy for the doctors and nurses and they can put patients' health at risk as well. If you go for treatment at a teaching hospital, basically any hospital with residency doctors, have passed med school but haven't completed their residency, there is a decent chance you get seen by someone who hasn't slept in 24 hours and makes less money than a fast food worker, per hour worked. It's basically how resident doctors get 10 years of experience and 4 years of residency. Oh, and it's not just ER docs. The same resident performing surgery on you may very well be on their 30th straight hour awake after having performed surgery all night. Isn't that comforting? And that same resident will have made $300 for that 30 hour shift. What a world we live in. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to be the first to know about Red Rabbit Reader's new videos. If you like our videos, please like them on YouTube and share them with your friends. We welcome your comments below. Press to start another of our videos.